again and welcome. I am the Reverend Ian Riddell. I have the joy and the honor of serving this congregation as its minister, and I'm so delighted to welcome you all here on this beautiful day. Uh, this is the time of year it is especially lovely to live in the desert. I'm glad you all chose to be here with us instead of out enjoying the beauty out there. So hopefully we'll find some beauty here together. This congregation, this community is committed to building a world, to creating in ourselves the possibility of hope, of justice, and of peace. And we gather together today in the joy of doing that work, of doing that that loving labor of coming together and seeing each other's beautiful faces. We start today, I'm going to start today with the words of author Ursula Le Guin uh, from her historical sociography of future California, Always Coming Home. Please bring strange things. Please come bringing new things. Let, let very old things come into your hands. Let what you do not know come into your eyes. Let desert sand harden your feet. Let the arch of your feet be mountains. Let the paths of your fingertips be maps. And the ways you go be the lines of your palms. Let there be deep snow in your in-breathing, and your out-breath be the shining of ice. May your mouth contain the shapes of strange words. May you smell food cooking you have never eaten. May the spring of a foreign river be your navel. May your soul be at home where there are no houses. Walk carefully, well-loved one. Move mindfully, well-loved one. Move fearlessly, well-loved one. Return with us. Return to us. Be always coming home. I invite you now to rise in body or in spirit as we sing together our opening song, Where Do We Come From? Actually, before you stand, um, we're, there are four parts to this song. I'll explain it. Uh, four parts to this song. Some of you have done it, but... Visitors, visitors, you're hearing the groans <laughs> of a people whose Sunday mornings quite often start with, we're going to sing this in parts. <laughs> so uh, there are four parts. We'll sing each of them twice through. Then we're going to sing the whole thing through. And then you get to pick whichever of the four parts you want to sing. Oh, I know, choice. <laughs> you could pick the one to sing that you remember. You can pick the one to sing that your body wants you to sing. You can pick the one to sing that your heart wants you to sing. Does that make sense? It all fits together really well no matter what you do, okay? Please rise in body and spirit. Joel, can we have a starting pitch for us? Where do we come from? Where do we come from? Mystery, mystery, 
And now Rev Ian is going to um, light our chalice. And please read along the words that are on the screen. May love be the spirit of this church. May the request for truth be a sacrament and service be its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, and to help one another in fellowship. This is our aspiration. And I invite Denise Jensen Eager to light our biopath candles. And as she does so, please read along. We light these candles in solidarity with the black, indigenous, and other people of color as we journey together for spiritual wholeness. May we, as a beloved community, work to dismantle racism and all forms of oppression. May we live out our principles of so justice, dignity, and equity for all. So here's a story about a frog in the bottom of a well. And it's a Chinese tale, and the, um, the narration and the meaning is told by many people, including Derek Lin. Derek Lin is a prolific Taoist uh, philosopher and author, and Revian has mentioned him many times before. So it goes like this. First off, there's a common expression in China, which in English means the frog at the bottom of the well. And according to Derek Lin, the expression comes from a classic story about a frog who meets a sea turtle. In brief, the story goes like this. Once upon a time in ancient China, there was a frog who lived in an abandoned well. He considered himself the master of the well and was very satisfied living there. One day he saw a sea turtle crawling nearby. They both greeted each other with the turtle commenting that the frog seemed happy and that was good. The frog smiled proudly and said, happy? Of course I'm happy. Look at my life. Wherever I want, I can hop around outside the well. When I'm tired, I can rest inside the well. Sometimes I soak in the water. Other times I enjoy the mud. The frog pointed to a tadpole living in the well and he commented, the tadpoles cannot compare to me. I know more than they do. I enjoy life much more than they can imagine. This well is my territory. I own the water. This is as good as it gets. The frog invited the sea turtle into the well to take a look to see for himself. The sea turtle followed but could not fit. He commented to the frog, I'm sorry, but your well is a bit small for me. The frog could not possibly understand that the well was small. It isn't small. It is, has more space than I will ever need. It's big. Do you even know what big means? The sea turtle was amused by the question, and he said, well, I come from the ocean, and I know the ocean is truly big. What do you mean, truly big? Twice as big as the well? Three times as big? The sea turtle shook his head. The ocean is larger than we can measure with a thousand miles, and deeper than we can measure with a thousand yards. The frog was confused. You could not imagine anything measured in thousands of miles or thousands of yards. The sea turtle further explained that the ocean is so big that changes in rain or drought over long periods have no effect. The frog continued to struggle to understand. The sea turtle commented, there is happiness in such a vast place, just as there is in your well. The sea turtle bid the frog farewell and resumed his journey. Derek Lin explains that the Chinese expression, the frog at the bottom of the well, means someone who has limited perspective, someone who is ignorant of his ignorance, 
and he asked the following question. Are you a tadpole, the frog, or the sea turtle? Are you in an abandoned well or the limitless ocean? My interpretation of the story goes like this. The tadpole is a metaphor for a person who has limited understanding. She never uh, ventures outside of her immediate environment, and she doesn't even realize that there is anything beyond her limited world that can be explored. The frog is somebody who has some knowledge, but lives in a closed world. He thinks he knows everything there is to know. He is arrogant, a know-it-all. He certainly feels superior to the tadpole, but he cannot possibly understand that someone else may have an entirely different world perspective or experience. The sea turtle has vast knowledge. In the ocean, she is surrounded by unlimited wisdom. Everything in the ocean is always different, changing, interesting. There is something to learn at each turn. The sea turtle goes out exploring with an open mind, understanding that the world is much bigger than she can ever know. So, which are you? The tadpole, the frog, or the sea turtle? As you know, uh, this Sunday is Share the Plate. So to learn more about the recipient this month, Katie, please come up, and she will introduce our guest. I'm Katie Foss, and I'm so glad that Fine Food Bank is our Share the, uh, Share the Plate recipient for today. I'm a longtime supporter, and they do very important and amazing work in the greater Coachella Valley region. And here to tell us all about that great work is Kelly Mui. Chesterton, Vice President of Development and Community Engagement. Please give generously to this wonderful organization. And if you have any questions for Kelly after the uh, presentation, she will be happy to answer them after the service at coffee hour. Thank you. Thank you everyone for the warm welcome and thank you to everyone here um, to line up our uh, presentation today. We're very honored to share more about the work that we do in the community that we all live in here. Um, so Fine Food Bank, can I get a show of hands of who here has been to or heard of Fine Food Bank? Wow, wow, that's amazing. So thank you all so much for your support and contributions made to our organization because without everyone's support here, we would not be able to do the work that we do, so thank you. Um, so Fine Food Bank was established in 1983. It actually all started with a gentleman named Wayne Robinson who was essentially doing food rescue. Um, and so he was kind of learning about the neighborhood and some people were not utilizing all of their grocery items and discarding them, so he decided to f rescue those items and then redistribute it to the neighbors that he learned had a need. Um, so that's how it all started. And he did that out of his home in his signature blue Pinto for years before Fine Food Bank was actually in a warehouse setting um, in Cathedral City. And then after uh, some, I think there was a fire in Cathedral City in that industrial zone area, and we relocated to Indio to where we are now off of Citrus Avenue. So, so I'm happy. we can go on to our next slide, please. So just to give you an idea of our service area, um, you know, we serve the greater Coachella Valley and the nine cities. We also serve the high desert region as far out as Blythe um, near the Arizona border, um, Mexico border south, as well as Anza. So we have a 5,000 square mile service area and we're also deemed as this 5,000 square mile service area's um, disaster response and emergency uh, rescue food bank. So what does that mean? That essentially means if a disaster were to happen in this region, um, as you all may recall, the, the tropical storm Hillary that rolled through in August last year, um, central government will deploy food, water, and resources to find food bank first. 
And then we would essentially disseminate out to all the local residents that are impacted by whatever disaster that occurred. So at that point, it's not just the low-income people that we're really serving right now. It's any one of us that could be without access to a grocery store that would need help. Um, so, so that is the service area. So we, we are covering close to 120,000 people on average each month that we're serving. That's comprised of seniors, children, and working families. Uh, nearly 40% of that is seniors, 30% um, children. And so that number is um, continually to grow as we see post-pandemic inflation, um, you know, and the high cost of living in California. Um, we can move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. So how does the food come into the food bank? We have four different um, ways that food comes in, but a lot of the ways we push it back out is through food distributions. So we do um, food distributions to local partner agencies like churches, schools, um, senior centers, boys and girls club, and we also um, hold our own mobile market distributions, which you'll see some of our trucks, you know, driving through town, and then we stop somewhere like Mathis Brothers or Palm Springs um, Convention Center, and we distribute for two hours. So that mobile market is solely run and operated by Fine Food Bank um, with our staff and volunteers. And then when we have the partner agencies that we work with that I just mentioned, bless you, all those other nonprofit organizations, we, they actually, um, we're actually like their distributor. We distribute the food items to them, and those partner agencies will then utilize the food and, and to prepare hot meals for their clients, um, like homeless shelters and stuff like that. So most of the food that we distribute to our partner agencies fill about 75 to 90 percent of their pantries so that's um so because our name is fine food bank most people think we're the traditional pantry or food bank but the scope and scale of the work that we do doesn't um doesn't end with just food assistance we provide a lot of outreach programs and services to our clients to ensure that they have other resources to help them get by if they're trying to make ends meet not just through food assistance um, so we do the, also a homebound delivery program for our seniors and, and anyone that's homebound that's restricted that cannot get to a site or a, or a partner agency location. So we do homebound deliveries and we package boxes at the food bank and volunteers actually deliver those boxes for us throughout the 5,000 square mile coverage area. And then for the agricultural community, um, farm workers that live here and work in this valley, we also do specialized distributions in that community as well to ensure that they have equitable food access um, just as much as everyone else in the community. Next, please. Um, here's an image of some of our mobile distribution sites, um, and you'll see like our warehouse is close to 36,000 square foot. It's like a mini Costco, so if I welcome anybody here who has never been there to, you know, contact me after um, at your coffee hour to schedule a tour. Um, you'll be able to see the operations and all the work that we do. We push out close to uh, 20 million pounds of food per year, and that's just distributing. That doesn't count what's um, coming in where we've weighed and discarded the waste and stuff like that. But yes, we um, are quite an operation. Next slide, please. Here's a list of just uh, some of our current partner agencies. It'll give you an idea of who, who these people are that we work with, and probably a lot of you all support those organizations as well. So know that anyone that supports us is really supporting a lot of other organizations in the Valley, so thank you. Um, next slide, please. This was actually an image um, at one of our super sites during COVID, and um, COVID kind of turned our operations um, into a, I mean, there were two things that really turned out great for it. You know, we have now better operational efficiencies because of that, and a senior home brown program, um, because that was birthed through COVID where everybody was isolated. But the efficiencies now at the mobile sites is curbside, whereas before pre-COVID, people were actually coming to our line with their cards, and it was just a little cumbersome, and sometimes people are not as mobile. And so now with um, uh, curbside, we just drop the items in their trunk and they go, and we're serving a lot more people and a lot faster and safer that way. So that was a great operational um, efficiency that came, evolved from that. Um, 
So as I shared earlier, how does the food come in? Um, we essentially have USDA government contracts, food rescue, retail donations, food drives, um, and then SB 1383 that came online last year where um, where essentially we're helping to reduce the food waste, right? And people donate to us the foods. And then we push that out into the community through all of our um, mobile, mobile pantries as well as our partner agencies. And next slide, please. Um, so a lot of the agricultural community, the local growers here actually do donate some of their surpluses. So retail partners, um, grocery chains as well, when they have something coming to code, or um, a surplus of something, or something as simple as the box being crushed aesthetically, they'll let us know that there's an opportunity for a pickup and our team will go and rescue those items to be able to redistribute that back into our community. Um, so just to share a little bit more about ways you can help find Food Bank, um, you can certainly volunteer at our uh, Food Bank directly in the warehouse where you would essentially have an opportunity to sort, pack, or box items for distributions. And just to give you an idea of the critical component that um, volunteerism plays for our organization is um, without that piece for find, we're not able to mobilize our resources and the food to our clients as quickly as we can. So, um, you know, pushing out 20 million pounds of food a year is not easy. And it's because the volunteers come in daily morning session, afternoon session, sometimes on the weekends, and even at the distribution sites. So last year, the totality of the hours contributed by volunteers was the equivalent of eight full-time headcount um, employees that FINE did not have to hire. So you can, so we solely rely, so there's only two people in our volunteer um, operations department, and all of those items that come into the food bank have to be sorted. Um, check for expiration, um, and when we get fresh fruits and produce, which we get a lot of because just we believe in healthy food banking, you know, while it's not required, Fine's philosophy is let's not re-inject the community with any health issues by giving them empty carbs and things, um, distributing food that doesn't help them thrive. So we ensure that 40% of the food that we push out is in a form of fresh fruit and produce. Um, so last year, we pushed out 20 million pounds of food. Uh, 5.6 million of that was in produce. So that is very, very important to us that we continue to do that. And so, yeah, for volunteerism, um, so, you know, we can always, we always need volunteers um, in the warehouse and at the distribution sites because as the summer months, um, are upon us, they, the need is still great, and with you know a, a resident count kind of a little quieter during those times, um, we see a lighter turnout for distributions and the warehouse, so we can always use help. So if you're a year-round resident, let me know. I'm happy to show you our warehouse. Um, and so yes, yeah, so just and if you as an individual want to um, say you're free on a Thursday afternoon, you can certainly go to our website, findfoodbank.org forward slash volunteer and view our calendar that's usually posted. Sorry, it's a little faint in that screenshot, but um, and you'll be able to see the days and times of, of opportunities that are available. And if you're interested, you can simply click on that link and sign up online to volunteer at that location or in in our warehouse. So all of that is actually posted online monthly. Um, so you'll be able to see about a month out of information. And so it's pretty user friendly, easy, and you just kind of sign up and show up if the schedule works for you. So and so like I was sharing, you know, eight and nine, um, the impact of volunteerism has for our organization is really, really um, crucial. And we can't do it without our neighbors here helping us. So thank you. And then so just to give you an idea of what fine service numbers were pre-COVID, we were generally serving about 80 to 90,000 people on average each month. And at the height of the pandemic, at its peak, we were serving as close to as 190,000 people on average every month. So almost three times the capacity of what the food bank can actually handle. The way in which our warehouse is set up, we are only able to process roughly 10 million pounds of food. 
So pushing out close to um, serving three times as many and almost 27 million pounds of food, it was way it was way over capacity. And so post pandemic, we saw the numbers kind of come down, but we're sitting at 150 thousand for a long time, and um, only up to last year, last fiscal year, most recently, we've seen that dip a little bit to 120,000 now on average every month. But post-pandemic inflation is still um, the leading reason why a lot of the clients are, are make, trying to make ends meet and still utilizing our services. Um, and as you know, California continues to increase its minimum wage, a lot of our clients are actually working multiple part-time jobs. So while their gross income at the end of the year when they file their taxes is higher and they're netting more, um, they don't actually get benefits from all the multiple jobs that they carry. So and it actually, um, it displaces them from all the CalFresh benefits that would, they would have um, qualified for and all these you know, other utilities assistance benefits and uh, cell phone and rental assistance. So kind of puts them in a pickle when, and so why, and that's the reason why we're still seeing a lot of need in our community. And so, um, as I shared earlier, we are the largest um, regional food bank in the area serving this 5,000 square mile footprint. And so, um, and, and most of what we do is food assistance, but the, the goal is to, you know, what we're doing today is providing the food assistance to and hunger today. And tomorrow our goal is to ensure that we're providing those services through outreach that the client can utilize to ensure that they can um, have more of their income stretched out longer for the needs that they really have at home. And then how do we end hunger for a lifetime? Um, we want the youth in our community. FIND has developed a lot of different youth programs recently to try to engage in the youth to ensure that they're, they're given the tools and resources to kind of break the cycles of poverty and advance into those higher education opportunities, higher wage opportunities so that they can you know, not be in that situation where they have to utilize our services, right? The goal is to reduce the line. And so, um, so yeah, so we have Opportunity Bank and we have financial literacy programs right now. And we also have, um, we partner with COD and a lot of schools to, to do local um, mini pantries within the school so the students work at the pantries and they learn about warehousing and inventory so that in the event that they want to do with work with retail partners in the region, you know, with Amazon coming online, there's a lot of opportunity there. So, so it's just not about what we're, just the food assistance, but we are working on t developing more programs that will um, help our clients build self-sustainability eventually, so. But yeah, so that's really all we do in a nutshell, and I look forward to answering any questions if anybody has any at your coffee hour. Again, thank you everybody for allowing me to share the work of our community, and it's thanks to everyone here that um, we can do it together. So thank you. Thank you for your generosity today and every day, and I think Jerry Lamadou is going to come and talk to us a little bit about why he gives to this community. I'm short, so I have to get this regulated pretty well. Um, Kelly, you did an incredible job. And if you're ever looking for a job as, you got your numbers down, so if you're looking for a job as a treasurer, you come right over here. <clears throat> So good morning. For those of you who um, don't know me, my name is Jerry Lamadou, and I'm the treasurer of UUCOD. Uh, I'm here today to tell you a little bit about why I support uh, our church. Microphone. Microphone, is that better? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Call me out on it, Jeannie, time. That's good. <laughs> so it, it's interesting because this week I really struggled as to what I was going to say today. I, it kept evolving over and over and over again, and I was just continually reminded about all the kindness I see in our community and what so many people do to support our community. And that I would like to spend the rest of the day telling you those things, but I have six minutes, I think. <laughs> so like so many people, Rob and I moved here from somewhere else. We operated our lives and we left our people behind and we are hoping to create a life just as 
good as we had in Los Angeles here. Um, and that meant develop, developing a new circle of friends um, who we hoped would become what we call our logical family, or our family of choice. Um, part of Rob's and my new life involved finding a uh, spiritual home, a faith community that we wanted to belong to. And if, at least for me, after a lifetime of missteps, a lifetime of missteps, <laughs> we found UUCOD eight years ago. Um, we came here hoping to find something that we could build our life around, uh, something to help us guide our lives, and something we could believe in. And on our first visit, before I came in, I picked up this card right here, which is our seven principles. And while I was waiting for the service to begin, I read the seven principles, and I was pretty much sold right there. Um, you know, it, it, it was like an epiphany. I'd found a church that spoke to what my beliefs were, and it seemed I'd found a church that I could unconditionally support and embrace its foundational beliefs. The other thing that happened that day was that Rob and I were warmly greeted by Roger Beeman at coffee hour. Thank you, Ro where is Roger? There he is. You know, going out to coffee hour the first time you're in attendance here is a little bit intimidating. You're afraid that you're gonna be left alone. And Roger came up and he said, what did he say? He said, hello, my name's Roger Beeman. <laughs> Welcome, welcome to our church. What, what are your names? And uh, we talked for probably 10 or 15 minutes, and he finished by saying, well, we, we hope to see you again here next Sunday. And I came the next Sunday and the next Sunday, and here, eight years later, I'm here. Thank you, Roger. Um, <laughs> um, as we continued to come to services, two things occurred. First, we developed a community. We started to, to meet people um, that sort of motivated us and thrilled us and taught us how to be good you use. Um, but I also found myself being drawn to different aspects of the service, key words, key concepts that sort of moved me. And so for instance, uh, even today, when I read our aspiration during the service, the words that stand out most to me are, and service be its prayer. Uh, at some level, I be believe that being of service is a form of giving back for all that I've been given in life, all the kindnesses that been, has been shown to me. I'm also moved by the concept of stewardship. I think of stewardship as meaning each and every one of us are shepherds of the church. We're shepherds of each other, and we have a responsibility to, to each other to ensure the well-being uh, of our congregants and the safety and the success of our community. Uh, and I also feel the term shared ministry is an ex extension of stewardship, which calls us to partner with our minister, with our minister, to help fulfill the mission of the church and our presence here in the overall uh, larger community. After about a year and a half, Rob and I met with Reverend Julie. We had decided to join the church. And after finding something, or a little bit about my background in finance, Reverend Julie said, well, would you like to join the finance committee? <laughs> well, I, I didn't know any better, so I said, sure. <laughs> And six months later, I was treasurer, and now almost six years later, I am still a treasurer. Uh, but it's been one of the, one of the best, best experiences of my life. Um, as a board member, I've worked closely with some incredibly, uh, some credible board members and ministers as we've navigated our community through financial challenges, transitions in ministry. Uh, legal and organizational changes, and COVID. COVID was a big one, uh, to name just a few of the topics that the board deals with you know, throughout the year. Um, I've found my fellow board members' dedication to our community inspiring. Our work together and our trust of one another has created 
in many cases, a deep, loving bond between us that continues to thrive. Um, and it's really a joy to me to have that. As part of my involvement with the Stewardship Committee and my role as treasurer several years ago, I set a personal goal to know and develop some level of a relationship with each member and friend of our community. That means members and friends of UUCOD. It means members and friends and former members who may never attend service, but services but make donations. It means visitors who come and attend our services and demonstrate their interest in our community. It means each and every one of you and for the people that are new today and are newish in the last month or so, we welcome you. You're welcome here. I'm still working on this goal to know everyone, but it's been an incredible experience getting to know so many wonderful people within our community. I see our members and friends helping our community each and every day. They run audiovisual services for our services. They make repairs and prepare refreshments. Our recent expansion of our sacred grounds largely entailed the work of a handful of people that put hundreds and hundreds of hours into the sacred grounds. Um, our maintenance service only comes every two weeks, so we have a cadre of people that come in and clean the church in the interim. Someone has to clean it on a Sunday and a Wednesday and a Friday before we rent it out at that point. Um, People greet, people count the collections plate, people lead committees, people pull weeds, people do a million tiny things that help our church. And I say thank you all for the work that you put into our church. Your good deeds do not go unnoticed. My parents taught me that you need to take care of things that are important to you, uh, that they have value to you. They also taught me that I had to be responsible to contribute some time to help with the chores around the house to make things better and easier for others in our, our family. As an individual member of this congregation, I believe that I have a responsibility to support our community as I did with my family by being generous with the resources I possess. UUCOD, this community we're all part of, is important to me. It nourishes me, and I feel, no obli and I feel an obligation to help it flourish. What better use of my time in retirement than to do small tasks with great love for a community that gives me so much? I believe all of you are welcome here. Bless you all. You enrich my soul. Thank you for your time. The quiet of our spirits, the quiet of our hearts that we are not ready to share yet. And so we pause now for a moment in the love of this community, the love of this gathered people, in the presence of the love which is larger and broader and deeper than we can possibly know. We pause and we rest for a moment in that love, bringing all of our joy, all of our sorrow, all of our anxiety about the world, our fears, our anger, our hope, our tenderness, and our kindness. We rest ourselves together in that love as we breathe in the quiet of this beloved community. May all beings know peace. May all beings know an end to suffering. May all beings know love. Will you join your voices together now, friends, as we sing Spirit of Life and Fuente de Amor.
quality today is interesting. I want to start today with a story, an old story that I first read in the book called Kindness, which is a collection of Buddhist tales edited by Sarah Conover. Over a century ago in Japan, there lived a Zen teacher named Nanin. One day, a university professor came to call on Nanin at his temple. Come in, come in for some tea, welcomed the old Zen master, leading the professor into the tea room. They sat down across from each other over a small bare table, and the old master sat in silence, perfectly at ease. Occasionally, he smiled at the professor warmly. Other times, he gazed out the window at the enchanting temple gardens. But the professor grew increasingly edgy with the silence. He squirmed, he tapped his fingers on the table mindlessly. He fixed his eyes anxiously on the door through which the tea should have come. Finally, the professor couldn't bear the silence a minute longer, and the only thing that came to his mind to talk about was a lecture on Buddhism he'd just given at the university. And so, clearing his throat loudly, <clears throat> he began a lengthy speech. Now, the old master made a fine audience. He nodded in a friendly way at the professor's most outstanding points. It seemed to have a look of unending curiosity. So the professor was encouraged to keep going. After all, lecturing was his business. After half an hour, still no tea had arrived, but the professor thought it might be impolite to bring attention to that fact, and so he continued with his speech on Buddhism. Nanin continued to be the most courteous of audiences. At last, an attendant carried in an elegant tray with a ceremonial teapot and two cups for the wise ones. Nanin smiled in his relaxed way, and in the deliberate manner of a Japanese tea ceremony, he carefully placed a teacup in front of his chattering guest. <laughs> then he slowly began to pour the hot liquid into his guest's cup. He poured and continued to pour until tea water ran like a small waterfall over the cup's brim and into his guest's lap. At this point, the professor's lecture came to an abrupt halt. What are you doing, he sputtered at the sage. Can't you see there's no more room in this cup? Nanin looked at his visitor earnestly. Just like this cup, sir, you are also too full. <laughs> you have too many ideas and opinions to learn. Please first empty your own cup. Then together we can learn something useful about Buddhism. This month, I know, <laughs> there's the sermon right there. Right? This month, we are focusing on some of our time reflecting together on generosity, on the various ways we can live lives of generosity. We're, we're thinking about that as we each discern how we will support this congregation financially. We pondered last week what it might mean to be generous of heart. Those of you in chalice circles will be talking about this as well. But today, I'd like to explore a different form of generosity, what I'm going to call generosity of mind. Now, when I say to you generosity of mind, moving through life with a generous mind, think for a moment of what that might mean for you. What does living with a generous mind require? Well, today I think it needs for us to have four practices ready to use as we encounter the world, a practice of openness to possibility, a practice of curiosity, a practice of questioning assumptions, and a practice of collaboration. Perhaps those are similar to some of the things you thought of just a moment ago. Perhaps they overlap each other closely. Perhaps they feel foolish or dangerous to you. I'm going to take a little time with each one of these. Openness to possibility. When you go to buy a new pair of jeans or a new pair of shoes, you don't just grab them off the shelf or the rack and pay for them and then they're yours until they fall apart. You try them on to be sure they fit. You walk around in them a little, you bend over, sit down, and if they don't fit, you take them off, put them back, and try on something else. You're not stuck with them. So I'm going to invite you to think about newness in this way. New ideas, new thoughts, new experiences. When we live our days practicing openness to possibility, we make the choice to approach the new with wonder instead of fear, 
to work to encounter new things as possibilities and not reject them outright if we're a little worried about them. Now, some of us come by this fear because of experiences of pain or trauma or conflict. And of course, you should choose safety for yourself if that's what you need. But outside of that, what might be possible if you responded with, wow, instead of, well... And I'm not just thinking of passively responding here. How might we get ourselves ready for newness? How might we prepare our minds for wonder and possibility? I think of the story I just shared with you and wonder how things would have been different if the professor had intentionally set expectations aside. If when he found himself talking and talking and talking and talking, he had paused and intentionally chosen to leave room for the sage, for learning, for being open to possibility. Now, I've joked before that ministers have only one sermon, one set of ideas they keep coming back to again and again and again. And I know for me, a part of that set of ideas is kindness. But looking back over the last couple of years that we've spent together, I see that I also talk about curiosity a lot. So, Let's talk about curiosity for a moment. In his book, Radical Curiosity, Questioning Commonly Held Beliefs to Imagine Flourishing Futures, Seth Goldenberg writes, without a robust culture of curiosity, imagination is rendered impotent, and we're all, all we're doing is surviving the day, administering transactions on autopilot, surrendering our agency, and perpetuating ineffective status quo. Our roles become reduced to administrators, of predetermined solutions rather than interrogators of the unknown. Goldenberg is clearly writing from a business or institutional focus, and he also holds agency and self-determination as high values. And I think his point is really important. Without curiosity, we're stuck, and we are nowhere as creative as we could be. My colleague, the Reverend Eric Hewitt, also wonders about what we diminish in ourselves and our movement when we choose bored skepticism, well, over curiosity in the face of new ideas. She writes, I want my people to encourage creativity with all the courage it demands, to honor vulnerability rather than shame the vulnerable, to respond to new ideas and invitations with curiosity, to create connection and live from connection. The culture change I want, she says, is to be part of, like anything, it's a continuum. It goes something like this, criticism, assessment, curiosity, appreciation, trust. She invites us to move from questions like, what do I dislike about this? How does this fail to meet my needs? Why should I listen to them? Why do I get to tell them what's wrong with it? How can I disconnect from this? to move from those questions toward questions like, what love and vision went into this? What would I lose by listening? Are they taking a risk by sharing their gifts? Whose needs or preferences matter as much as mine or more than mine? If this doesn't serve me, who might it serve? How does this strengthen the larger we? Starting from a place of curiosity, the second practice, intellectual, Emotional, relational is how we increase the pool of common understanding, how we build connection, how we get beyond our own habits and invite creativity. I want to think about our willingness to question assumptions next. Goldenberg is concerned about our becoming, quote, administrators of predetermined solutions. Makes me remember a scene from an old favorite television show that leads to the third practice, being willing to question assumptions. There's a scene, (coughs) excuse me, in the sixth season of The West Wing that has always sat uncomfortably in my memory. In this scene, the deputy chief of staff, Josh Lyman, who has committed a public faux pas about cars and, and petroleum, is meeting with proponents of various forms of what were then alternative energy sources, such as solar or wind or geothermal. As each of the representatives shares their visions, they are met from the others by derision and critique from the others in the room. 
Solar is accused of wanting to pave the country with panels and bankrupt everyone in the process. Wind is accused of killing wildlife and destroying migration patterns. It goes on like that. Comments and questions echo the criticism end of Erica Hewitt's spectrum. What do I dislike about this? How does it fail to meet my needs? Why should I listen to them? How can I disconnect from this? Not one person in the room raises the point that the situation we are currently living with, the petroleum-dependent society and economy in this case, comes with its own drawbacks and impacts on the ecology and life of the planet. The petroleum economy is a legacy narrative that is unexamined when considering possible alternatives. In Radical Curiosity, Goldenberg writes, legacy narratives have a stronghold over the public imagination. They carry entrenched traditions and associated messages that reinforce the narrative power structures and signals anchoring our self-identities. Here's the pattern I see. A new idea is presented and critiques and questions begin immediately, all grounded in the assumption that the status quo has no impact, no negative results, the assumption that the ways things are is a neutral place. Think about, think about thinking about renewal energy while assuming that fossil fuels have no impact. Solar panel, a uh, solar and wind impact migration patterns and construction and construction uh, construction patterns. But what impact do petroleum and extraction and oil pipelines already have on our environment that we're assuming is just neutral, zero. When people are questioning the development and purchase of electric cars and concerned about the environmental impact of them, the mining and processing of rare metals that can have destructive human and environmental impacts, yes. But what about the impact of petroleum extraction and gasoline production not to mention emissions issues that are already there that we just assume are zero. Another couple of points, and I'm not trying to convince you either way in these conversations, just encouraging some thinking. When we were talking about marijuana use and legalizing marijuana, we questioned the social and medical impacts of it and ignored or forgot about or didn't pay attention to the societal, medical, and personal impact that alcohol and tobacco, for example, already have. When we're questioning prison reform and police reform, we assume, when assuming that the current methods have no impact in the world. I'm not telling you what to think about these issues. I have my opinions, of course. But you get to think your own thoughts. I am asking you to make a choice to think and get in the habit of wondering what assumptions you are making about the status quo without even noticing. Of course, these unexamined uh, assumptions, the status quo, legacy narratives, often serve only a small group of people, said Goldberg, and that's something to think about as well. And I want us to think a little bit a practice of collaboration an understanding that we cannot do the work of change, the work of love, the work of our lives alone. Radical independence must be replaced by radical interdependence. We have to reject the great man theory, great woman theory of change. Frodo wasn't able to destroy Sauron's ring on his own. His quest required a fellowship and the concerted efforts of dozens and thousands of others. I've talked to you before about Ted Lasso, and he wasn't able to shift the culture of the football team on his own. He required co-conspirators to work together to move relationships to the center of their collaboration. Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, William Barber in our day, these people are wonderful, fabulous, powerful, inspired people. But they did not do the work. They did not make the change on their own. There were hundreds of thousands of collaborators and co-conspirators with them. I remember an experience I had in San Diego where a large protest was being made against some government action. I apologize. I can't remember what it was now. And that there were some folks who were going to get themselves arrested. They were going to block the entrance to a courthouse. And the planning beforehand, it wasn't just let's all go and get arrested. 
These people didn't operate on own. Each of them had a contact person who would speak to their family and their friends, let them know what was happening. Each of them had a phalanx of people to support that process so that we all knew before we went in who was going to be arrested, who was going to make themselves available to arrested, and who would avoid it so that they could support, support that work. So we do not do this work alone. In Emergent Strategy, Sonia Renee Taylor asks, are you actively practicing generosity and vulnerability in order to make the connections between you and others clear, open, available, and durable? Generosity, she says, means giving of what you have without strings or expectations atta attached. The generosity of mine. I wanted to invite you today into intentionally cultivating practices that build a generosity of mind, a practice of openness to possibility, a practice of curiosity, a practice of questioning assumptions, and a practice of collaboration. And often I have at this point something poetic or rhetorically graceful to say as I finish my words, but I don't think I do today, sorry. I just want to invite you to see, if you don't already, the world around us is in turmoil and it is desperately in need of people whose minds and hearts are open to possibility, whose minds and hearts are willing to see clearly, to be curious, to question assumptions, to relate with other people with love and kindness and curiosity, to be the people like we say we want to be. It's an invitation. We don't know what the world will look like on the other side of change. The road may be muddy and rough getting there. We will get there, but only if we travel together. Only we move forward with a generous heart and generous minds in a spirit of love and possibility. I hope we can answer the invitation together in community. And I'd like you to lift your voices in community now as we sing together our you see, you see how I did that? Uh, sing together our closing song, Wo Ya Ya. We are <clears throat> Now, as Revian extinguishes the chalice, please read along. <laughs> we'll pause a second. Right, you ready? Please read along the closing words that appear on the screen. We extinguish the flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. The ease we carry in our hearts until we are together. Things happen. So we have uh, some news, some congregational news. So Denise. Thanks, Stephen. Uh,
Two pieces of information from Social Justice Committee. Uh, first piece of information, you have 11 days, just 11 days, to order your Side with Love t-shirt. This is going to be really important if you plan on um, handing out at Easter food baskets at Galilee Center before Easter in March. You're going to need one. <laughs> You're going to need one if you plan on volunteering with Laundry Love in April. You're going to need one. You've got 11 days, okay? We got to get 15 t-shirts to place the order, okay? Order yours. This is going to be the only sale we hold this year, okay? You're going to need it for the Pride Parade. Order yours. The next uh, announcement I have is that out on the patio, oh, first, you've probably already received your California ballot. On there is Prop 1. It looks really easy to answer, but it's not. Out on the patio afterwards, where there will be a handout with the pros and cons of Prop 1. You can look at it. Get your coffee, talk to your friends, pick up a handout, get your questions answered, and uh, make your vote. Thank you. As we get ready to leave, friends, just a reminder that we will be celebrating the life of our beloved Gloria Cap this afternoon, starting at 2 o'clock here and online if you're not able to be here in person. Um, if you are coming here um, and you're a regular park on the street, because we're gonna, be, we're gonna be busy this afternoon, so we wanna leave as many parking spots for guests as we can. I finish with these words of the Reverend, the Reverend Rebecca Parker from her work, Choose to Bless the World. None of us alone can save the world. Together, that is another possibility waiting the choice to bless the world is more than an act of will, a moving to forward into the world with the intention to do good. Is, it is an act of recognition, a confession of surprise, a grateful acknowledgement that in the midst of a broken world, unspeakable beauty, grace, and mystery abide. There is an embrace of kindness that encompasses all of life, even yours. And while there is injustice, anesthetation or evil, there moves a holy disturbance, a benevolent rage, a revolutionary love, protesting, urging, insisting that what is sacred will not be defiled. Those who bless the world live their lives as a gesture of thanks for this beauty and this rage. With both of those in our hearts, friends, go in peace to love and serve this amazing world.